has changed enormously over my professional lifetime. And I venture to predict uh, that as a result of the current crisis, it will change even more over the coming decade. Um, economists of my generation were brought up, we were brought up to believe that we should analyze economies in terms of as if atomistic, maximizing individuals who only interact through market prices, as if we were all anonymously playing economics games in front of computer screens. Neither the intensity of our preferences, our emotions, nor our beliefs counted for anything. Of course, we knew the world was not like that. But the role of economics was to see how far we could push on this atomistic, egoistical hypothesis. Uh, Gary Becker, who was Meek Milton Friedman's successor at Chicago, is the best exemplar, exemplar of this approach. It's claimed, I don't know whether it's true, that on the day that his wife informed him that she proposed to divorce him, he penned an article on the economics of divorce. One, one can distinguish between the different social science disciplines, either on the basis of, of the methodology that they adopt or on the basis of the phenomena they study. Economists wanted it both ways. Um, we wanted the phenomena regarded as part of economic life um, to be studied on the basis of this maximizing methodology. It doesn't work. Beliefs and emotions matter for economic decisions. As George Akerlof showed us very clearly yesterday, concepts of fairness enter all labor market decisions. But fairness, fairness cannot be explained in terms of individual maximization. Rational maximization has not proved a good way of understanding investors' portfolio decisions. And there are numerous other examples. We're now all behavioral economists, and economics is now a behavioral subject. And so we're honored here to have with us one of the main exponents of modern behavioral economics. How people actually behave, which differs from the behavior of these abstract computer autonomous, matters for economic decisions and outcomes. Well, the English and French, as everyone knows, have been at war for 700 years. And this also extends to economics, um, though not for 700 years. <laughs> but I remember Frank Hahn, when I was a student, remarking, that, apropos of uh, Malinvaux, that no French economist had ever understood Keynes. Um, we English uh, pride ourselves on being pragmatic, the French are Cartesian. That's all right in practice, but what about the theory? is the remark of the French civil servant. Uh, American universities draw on all the talents, and in fact, that's the, one of their major strengths. Um, and none more so than Princeton, where um, Roland Benabou is a professor. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Roland, who's a French intellectual who writes a beautiful English, and who poses analytically questions which the English would perhaps prefer to leave for discursive after-dinner discussion over the port. It's a great pleasure. I hope that I was not. <laughs> Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for such a nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, is there a way that these slides can be projected or? Okay, great. Thank you. Technical check. Non abbiamo forse. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So. I I like to stand up. Hopefully, you can still hear me. So, <clears throat> I'm I'm going to talk about uh, the formation and persistence of collective or social beliefs, and particularly interesting uh, for economists who usually think of uh, individuals as rational calculators, as as was just uh, we were just reminded of, are the beliefs that involve some form of reality distortion or as a psychologist would call it, cognitive dissonance or dissonance reduction. And in the economic realm, those seem to be relevant in, uh, many, um, in many aspects. Organizational overconfidence, 
contagious market exuberance, particularly in asset markets. Thank you. Political ideologies, culture, religion, and I will uh, mostly talk about the first three, or only the first two if I run out of time. And I borrow the term groupthink from Janice, who was a political scientist or political psychologist, uh, who studied episodes of foreign policy making and this, um, identified or claimed to have identified eight symptoms of what he called groupthink, which are listed for you here. Illusion of invulnerability, uh, collective rationalization, belief in inherent morality, etc., which lead organizations of different types to uh, generally bad decisions, generally bad outcomes. And it's summarized in the dictionary as a pattern of thought, so we want to understand how people think, uh, especially when they're together, characterized by self-deception, forced manufacture of consen consent, and conformity to view group values and ethics. Now, to go right into uh, an example, I'm going to talk first about ideology and give you some examples. So let's take a nice neutral question that we can all agree on, such as the free enterprise and free market economy is the best system on which to base the future of the world. So do you strongly disagree, somewhat disagree, somewhat agree, strongly agree? I think I have a kind of a feeling for what the answers would be in this room. But um, in general, answers differ widely both within a country and across countries. And this is the result of a poll where I think about 10 or 20,000 people were, were um, polled in each country. And you can see, first of all, that around the average degree of, let's say, support or belief in markets, uh, which is the blue bar, uh, the average for the whole sample at the bottom is 61%, we have a wide dispersion. And some countries are where you would expect them. In the US, 71% of respondents agree that free markets and free enterprise are likely to be the best solution to the problems of the world. Uh, interestingly, China, which uh, is in the, towards the bottom, there's even more support for markets. Um, that's a recent phenomenon. At the other extreme, we have Russia, where only 43% uh, of the people endorse markets. And even more extreme, we have France, my country, where only 36% of the people believe in markets. Now, these are the beliefs that people state when they're just you know, asked about it. What's the importance of what they believe or say they believe? Well, here we can look at a little correlation between the extent of support for markets or belief in markets, which is what we just looked at, and that's what's along the horizontal axis. Going to the right are more um, uh, stronger market beliefs, and the extent of state intervention in the economy measured by the share of taxes and GDP. And basically what you can see is that you know, in countries where people are more likely to respond that they believe in markets, the government is smaller relative to the economy, and vice versa in countries where uh, it's the reverse. Um, you can do that with other indicators. This is an indicator of, of labor market regulation, and perhaps not surprisingly, where people believe in markets, Canada, US, Great Britain, etc. there's little regulation of the labor market. Where people don't believe, like France and over there, Turkey, uh, there's much more. So one way to, to look at this is to say, well, you know, democracy works or political pressure works to the extent that people like or dislike markets. That's what's going to be delivered by the political system. Another story, which is maybe a little more worrisome, is to say, well, where do these beliefs come from? And how can people uh, in today's world believe such different things about how the world works? And perhaps there is something in the other direction that people it's not just that people get what they like or what they believe in, but they start liking or believe in what they get or what they're stuck with. So the causality could be going in both ways, and that's what I'm going to be arguing uh, in this talk. More generally, there's a whole set of beliefs that are economically important that concern theories of the world and that differ widely across countries. So we've seen the relative merits of the state and the market. There's also role of effort versus luck in life outcome. Why are some people rich, others poor? Trust, which, was, um, um, which is a, also a, plays a big part in this, in this uh, conference, festival, religion, culture. These are all beliefs which vary across countries, are correlated strongly with policy, vary across individuals, and are correlated with how people vote. 
Interestingly, each group or country thinks it has the truth, not just for itself, but everybody would be well inspired to um, imitate them. And, you know, you can think also about religion. Um, not surprisingly, not everybody can be right, so it's not difficult to find evidence that shows that these beliefs are um, inconsistent with the data. And yet they persist, a kind of collective mistake, which sometimes can be beneficial. We can think of, you know, good morale, uh, the audacity of hope, or things like that, or we can think of uh, disastrous errors. Here's a couple more examples. This is the belief that luck determines income. Uh, more uh, attribution to luck uh, as you go to the right, and social spending as a percent of GDP. Again, you see that where people think it's all about luck, they want to redistribute. Where, if, where they think it's about efforts and talent, they don't want to redistribute. Another belief I mentioned is religion. Average reported importance of God in a person's life. Over there in the USA, at one extreme, at the other, Sweden and Denmark. Italy, somewhere in the middle. The more people report believing in God, the less social spending there is. And again, the question is, you know, which drives which? So let's kind of uh, go from this big picture to a smaller picture, because it's always uh, more you should always start you know, looking at problems, at small problems, because bigger ones. Let's think about organizations like firms or government bureaucracies, etc. Here also we see occasionally strange beliefs with bad consequences. So in the aftermath of corporate disasters, you can think of Enron, things like that, there are often, there's a word that comes back all the time, which is red flags. And there were many, there were often many red flags which people ignored, rationalized, or did not want to see. And this goes along with a certain discourse or rationale. We're better than, you know, this time is different. We're smarter. We have better computers, better tools, and so on. Similarly, when people engage in, in fraud or what we economists would call moral hazard, uh, it's often just regular people who find ways of justifying to themselves the unethical things that they do, whereas in other aspects of their life, they're perfectly good people. So self-deception is important there as well. Um, example of disastrous wishful thinking and reality denial in organizations, we have the Challenger and Con Columbia Space Shuttle disasters on which uh, extended in reports were written which document the extent to which people did not want to look at the evidence. I'll give some examples. Similarly, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the U.S. and probably in other countries uh, was caught in a similar kind of willful blindness and we could say also the Fed. Finally, we can think about, or next, we can think about mar markets where a lot of individual participants get caught in some kind of frenzy or some irrational exuberance and think that the price of this or that is going to keep going up, and they make investments based on that, and eventually it collapses. And again, this goes along with strange rationale, such as this is a new era, uh, we need new measures for valuing firms, and so on. So some elements of psychology such as over-optimism, wishful thinking, et cetera, seem relevant to understand this. Not relev not, that's not the only thing that's relevant. Standard economics is also relevant. What's important is the interaction of the two, the interaction of incentives, markets, and so on, with the fact that people very often invest in their beliefs and treat them kind of protectively, either because it makes them feel better, uh, less afraid of the future, or sometimes it helps them function more effectively. And I'm going to focus mostly on the effective value and the emotional value of these beliefs. So the rest of the talk is going to be organized, let's say, going from smaller to larger units. I'm going to talk about um, realism and denial in small groups, like corporations or government units, then financial markets, and then if there is time, uh, I'll talk about social beliefs about the state and the market. Um, status and laissez-faire. And the way I'm going to proceed is kind of give examples, mostly through kind of quotations and things like that, of what seems to be the role of collective illusions in each of these phenomena. Um, and then I'll try to sketch how economists uh, think about this or try to conceptualize the interaction between individual psychology and collective interactions in a market, in a, in a bureaucracy, and so on, and the type of results that this can lead to. 
Okay, so let's think first about organization. A firm would be the, ob the obvious example, a bank, but it could also be a government unit. And let me start briefly by reviewing some, or presenting, let's say, some findings of uh, investigations, or just sometimes some quotations from, from our uh, reports in the media that uh, alert us to the, uh, I, to, the, to the possibility that people may not be fully rational in the usual sense, at least, in processing information, in looking at evidence, that they might want to see certain things and not others. So this is from the report on the, um, one of the uh, space shuttle disasters, uh, the one that burned because it lost some protective tiles, and the report uh, emphasizes that the managers resisted information. In particular, they, were, they refused to get pictures of the damage to assess whether it, would be, uh, whether it was a fatal damage or just a minor maintenance issue. They had basically, as indicated here, decided in advance what uh, the state of the world w was, what the reality was, and since they knew what reality was, they didn't need to look at evidence, and they didn't want to look at evidence. Similarly, uh, in the uh, extensive uh, you know, books that have been uh, written on Enron, Again, there was a lot of malfeasance there, but there's also blindness, in particular by the CEO, who um, not only uh, lost a lot of money, in the end he died, but he, at the same time as he was kind of cynical in some ways, he was also very, he had his head in the sand in many other ways and got burned financially even before the company got bankrupt. Uh, Bear Stearns CEO, uh, James Kane. Uh, had 6% of the stock, was a multi-billionaire during the whole crisis. Reportedly, he was away playing golf and bridge at a professional level all the time. And a few weeks or months later, he had lost his billions and just had a few meager millions left. Um, another example, um, it, another pattern is what's called normalization of deviance, that is something happens, an anomaly, a danger signal that should cause you to pause and, and, and stop and, and you know, uh, take things carefully. But since it didn't blow up the whole thing, it didn't blow up the space shuttle in this instance, uh, then you say that in fact it's normal that these things should happen and as they start happening more and more frequently, then you worry about them less and less, whereas you should be worrying about them more and more, but the rationale is, well, so far it hasn't blown up. And you can see uh, evidence or parallels to that also in the financial sector. Um, <coughs> so evidence that the design was not performing as expected was reinterpreted as acceptable and non-deviant, which diminished perceptions of risk. Uh, anomalies that did not lead to catastrophic failure were treated as a source of valid engineering data that justified further flight. You could just change the words to, you know, securities and investments, and, and you have, there you have it. Regulators, I think, were also, uh, I mean, they were subject to some political pressures, but they were also a bit um, uh, blind, or at least uh, unwilling to look at the evidence. Um, in the Inspector General reports on how, Bear, on how the um, so Securities and Exchange Commission dealt with the problems at Bear Stearns, again, this word comes back, num aware of numerous potential red flags. Uh, what did they do in response to those red flags? Nothing. Uh, they did not take actions to limit these risk factors, and they didn't, did not even look more closely. They had only a very small number of people to examine the whole industry, and they hadn't completed a single inspection uh, by the time the crisis had, had hit. At the Fed, it's the same thing. One of, the f one of the inside people, a Federal Reserve governor, warned Alan Greenspan about the, you know, the coming or potential problems with um, subprime mortgages. He was not asking that he put a stop to it, but that they investigate the potential dangers, and he was rebuffed. Similarly, the Office of the Control of the Currency prohibited those agencies that did want to investigate, that did want to look for evidence from doing so. So again, this pattern of not wanting to see, and the examples I use here are from the US, but I'm quite sure we could find some from other countries. Last example is from foreign policy having to do with Iraq. This is a very nice quotation from a, a journalist who interviewed a top White House official who, and was told that guys like him were in what I call the reality-based community, which he defined as people who believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. So the journalist nodded, thought it was a good thing, and murmured something about enlightenment, enlightenment principles and empiricism. But he had it all wrong. 
that's not the way the world really works anymore, continued the official. We're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. So we don't need to study discernible reality and evidence. And while you, or us, are studying that reality judiciously, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too, and that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors, etc. Okay, so in some sense, that's what I want to do here. He was partially right. I want to study people who think that they can create their own reality. This is a little cartoon. Uh, I don't know if you can see the caption or if it's been part of your translations. Uh, these uh, ostriches around the table uh, are sitting around the table and the president says, the motion has been made and seconded that we stick our heads in the sand. So collective delusions is what I'm about. So now let me move from kind of um, you know, informal evidence um, <coughs> to kind of a sketch of how we can think about that. So let's think of an organization, a firm, uh, for instance, where participants, the, wor the, the workers in the firm, can at, you know, choose to work hard or not work hard to, towards uh, the objectives of the firm, or people can invest money also in a project. And you know, whether this pays off or not is going to be revealed only in the long run, a few years from now, let's say. And it can be success or failure. You can become very rich or you can lose it all, your pension, your job maybe go to jail if it was illegal. And that all depends on uh, what other people are doing because we're in a group. Are they working hard? Are they investing? Are they making good deals, bad deals? And whether the whole enterprise is a worthwhile one. Is it a sound um, product that we're selling or not? Uh, are these, uh, is the market in which we're investing strong or weak? And so on. Is the shuttle, you know, um, are these O-ring problems minor or major? And so on. So <coughs> that's the kind of standard economic part of the, point of, the, of the problem. And then there are emotions or feelings, what are called anticipatory feelings. We as humans always project ourselves in the future, and then we either worry or we rejoice, depending on whether we think the, the future is going to be grim or pleasant. So if it looks like the firm project is uh, on the right track and riches await us and so on, then we feel good, we're happy, and, and maybe even we might be more productive. If we're scared that things are starting to look uh, shaky, that the company might go down, that what we're doing might be revealed to be illegal, etc., then we have stress, we um, you know, can't sleep at night, we fight with our spouses, we get ulcers, and so on, and that's all unpleasant. So beliefs about the future become something that we consume, something that, we, that affects our well-being from day to day, and not just objective information, the way we usually treat them as economists, but something that you care about directly. Given that, uh, we have to think about how, what should I believe then? So beliefs are formed by a combination of standard economic or cognitive, uh, objective cognitive process, an emotional, more psychological one. We can see, let's say, in the company, how things are doing. Does the CEO look like he knows what he's doing, or does he look insane? Does there, is there a, you know, are people saying that there's a bubble in the housing market or not? What are the engineers saying about the shuttle? So we get some signals, and the question is not just to be informed, but what do you do with this information? In particular, when it's scary information, when it suggests that the future is bad rather than what you had before. So we have a choice, conscious or unconscious, as to acknowledge and deal with bad news in particular, or look away, misread, forget, uh, and so on. There's a trade-off there. If I don't pay attention or I rationalize away good, bad news, then I feel better. But on the other hand, it can be dangerous because I might have to pay for that in the future. So I'm going to summarize good news with a little green flag, which says things are all clear. You can keep working, can keep investing, and most likely you'll be successful. Or red flag, which says, wait a minute, things are not the way you thought. Uh, it's getting dangerous. Maybe the, the project will generate losses. The interest, what do people do when they see famous red So there are two basic things you can do. One is I'll call real. You call a green flag a green flag. A red flag, a red flag, and when there's a red flag, you stop and think and, you know, limit your losses and pretend that the great red flag wasn't really red, it was kind of greenish and, you know, or it's just 
cameras that are raising a red flag, they always red flag, so let's not pay attention to them, and let's go ahead as if it was green. So you engage in you know, self-deception, uh, self rationalization, and so on. You treat the information in a biased kind of way. Of course, we can do uh, some of both, be partially realistic, partially um, uh, in denial. And the trade-off is the one that I mentioned. More denial makes you, you know, makes the short term more pleasant. The future looks more rosy. On the other hand, you might have to pay for it down the line. So <coughs> to emphasize these uh, effective benefits of uh, putting on rosy glasses, these two women are walking down the street, and one says to the other, I'm doing a lot better now that I'm back in denial. But what happens on the line, that's another question. So let's try to capture this trade-off with a very simple representation of you know, how people deal with bad news. So you suppose that there is a red it's not working well. Okay. Suppose suppose there's a red flag that has been raised. <coughs> Excuse me. And are you going to um, acknowledge it and be realistic? You can be realistic, you know, with hundred percent, that's what the one stands for, and that's what you know standard economic agents would would do. Or if you go to the other extreme, if you're very susceptible to hope, fear, uh, and wishful thinking, you can be 0% realist, and whenever there are bad news, you put your head in the sand or you pretend that the red was green. And you can kind of locate yourself or people you know or politicians you know, you know along this graph to see how uh, they deal with bad news anywhere from full realism to full denial to somewhere in between. Now the question, so this is what the individual, this is basic individual psychology and everybody will differ on where they are, you know, in this, in this graph. Now the question is, now that we're all interacting, we're all working at Enron or we're all working at Bear Stearns or we're all working for the government, you know, how does our willingness to put our head in the sand depend on whether other people also have their head in the sand or are making, uh, you know, considerate, um, um, uh, objective and cold, um, cold decisions, objective decisions. There are two cases that, that we can think of, one good and one bad. The good one is when the collective illusion corresponds to what you might call group morale, and morale is, you know, is a good thing, for example, for a sports team or for a company. It's good to have high morale, to think that you can, you know, to some extent, um, succeed even though things look bad right now. So this is a case when Given that they're bad news, maybe, so that is the project doesn't have such a high return, uh, it's not worth my while to work hard in it, put more money in it, etc. but I'm happy if others remain extremely optimistic and they put more money in it, they do more of these deals. Similarly in the sports team, if I know that we have a small chance of winning, maybe I'm not going to run hard and try to score because it's, I could get injured and I know we have a low chance of winning, but I'm perfectly happy if my teammates keep a high morale, if they don't want to hear about how much better the other team is, they're increasing our chance of winning, and I'm not paying the cost. So this is a case where when someone else or other people around me uh, are deluded or in denial about um, the, the, you know, the fact that we're not in the best of all possible words, this is good for me. I benefit from other people's denial. So when there's a red flag, but then and other people don't want to see the red flag and they keep a high morale and that's good for me, then the red flag isn't as threatening to me because uh, it's being partially compensated for by the strong morale that my teammates or co-workers are keeping. And therefore, reality is not as scary. So in this little chart that shows you how different people who have different degrees of susceptibility to hope, fear, etc., how much realistic they are, when they go from, when one of these people goes from being surrounded by realists to being surrounded by people who are in denial of the form that I just mentioned, who keep a high morale and that's good for them, they become more willing to accept reality. They become more of a realist. So as more other people become uh, less realist, I become more of a realist. The other case, which is more interesting, is what I call the groupthink, and that's typically when there's very high stakes to the project. So in the good, in, you know, in the good scenario, the green flag scenario, we all get rich or I get rich. In the bad scenario, things get really ugly. And in particular, if people keep, don't pay attention to 
the red flag if they keep setting up you know, either dubious or illegal or highly leveraged deals that could blow up the company and lose me my job, lose me my pension, then by their delusion they're now hurting me and they're making a bad reality worse. So if I was slightly afraid of reality, now I'm much more afraid of the coming train wreck, which has been worsened by other people's blindness. So this is the case where the denial of others makes a bad reality even worse, even more fearful, and so I'm more inclined now to join them with my head in the sand as we go from being surrounded by realists to being surrounded by people in denial who can't you know, stop for red lights and are imposing greater risks, I'm going to also join them in denial. So this is what I call the mutually assured delusion or MAD principle. That is, and it's very perverse. It says when reality avoidance, call it good morale, is beneficial, when you'd like more of it, it's not contagious. The more people have it, the less of, I, of it I, I, sh I, I have. Conversely, where it's detrimental, when it creates more risk for everybody, that's when it spreads. That's when it reinforces each other. It re reinforces itself across people. Um, <clears throat> so we're, people in an organization are going to be thinking about reality in ways that are inter interdependent, and particularly in the second way, in they're going to tend to all think of reality in the same way. Uh, that is, in particular, uh, if others don't, want to see red flags as a chance that I also don't want to see them. So it's kind of a depressing result. So this MAD principle uh, for mutually assured destruction maybe should be renamed the MAD off principle <laughs> because people do show a willingness to ignore red flags and this is one of the best examples uh, of people including very sophisticated individual investors and companies you know putting money in this 2015 to 10, 12 to 15 percent guaranteed return on your money based on some secret undisclosed strategy, etc. And we know the end. So let me just skip that because I'm running out of time and give you what comes out of, of, the, of, of, of this little exercise. The same organization or similar organizations can have a culture of realism or in the bad case a culture of denial where bad news we look away from them uh, in the case where denial is a bad thing. So that's why it's perverse. That's why it's mutually assured delusion and destructions. Uh, all persist in the co in that case, everybody persists in the wrong course of action because they're afraid of acknowledging reality. And the reason the reality is so uh, frightening is because other people are uh, ignoring red flags and increasing the risks that we all face. When is it likely that we are uh, caught up in this bad group think? When we're very dependent on each other, when your mistakes damage me a lot and my mistakes damage you a lot and there's no way, no easy way I can get out. When the project is very risky, that is in the good case we all get very rich, in the bad case it's terrible for all of us. And these are typical of new technologies, uh, high financial leverage, high pay incentives and so on. <clears throat> We can also think about uh, organizations of hierarchy, hierarchies. Some people are more important than others. And, <coughs> and the same intuition tells, me, tells us that I'm going to adapt my way of thinking to the way of thinking of the people whose uh, decisions and therefore whose beliefs, realism or denial, have the greatest impact on whether it's my paycheck, my pension, my welfare in general. Okay, so my outcome depends on whether the company's project is good or bad, that is we've had good news, a green flag or a red flag, but also on how, the, let's say, the manager deals with a case where there's a red flag. So if there's a red flag and the manager stops and is careful, losses are going to be limited for him and for us, the workers. On the other hand, if the managers uh, or um, management charges ahead, ignoring all red flags, keeps investing more, opening new factories, taking more risk, then we're going to bear some of those consequences that we might lose our job, we might lose our pension, and so on. So this idea that uh, our beliefs, our way of seeing the world is, is interdependent, and in particular that the direction is one from those who have the most impact to those who have the less impact, we can think of a simple hierarchy Let's say person one is the manager, person two is the worker or many workers. 
That's one example, but we could also think about, you know, a marriage, a husband and a wife. And the case that's interesting is when one person's delusions are very damaging to the other, but not the reverse. So in my case, it was the manager. In that scenario, this same MAD principle predicts that it's the, in this case, the workers are going to adapt the way of seeing the world of the manager. So I, uh, you can look, you can ignore that little graph and just uh, look at those bubbles uh, or those bullet points up there. Uh, if the boss is a realist, deals realistically with bad news, that's what's happened on the left side of the graph, the subordinates will also be facing, willing to face bad news because the damage is limited, the manager is a realist. On the other hand, if the manager or the captain of the ship is in denial and is going to take us to uh, a disaster and there's not much I can do, then it's more tempting to find re reasons why maybe he might know what he's doing after all. So the lesson here is that subordinates adapt their vision of the world to that of their boss, and beliefs are going to trickle down the hierarchy, whether it's realism or delusion. Okay. Um, now, how could you counteract this damaging groupthink in the case where it's bad? I've said sometimes it's good if we are uh, in kind of a uh, sports team type of interaction. Well, if it's group morale, um, then you don't want to uh, limit the extent to which people are overly optimistic. In fact, you want to encourage it. You want to encourage group morale. You want people to be slightly over-optimistic. And we see how coaches uh, or sometimes uh, employers try to you know, foster the morale of their uh, players or of their workers. In the case of groupthink, what you need is somebody to break the illusion. You need somebody to dig up the red flag that nobody was willing to look at and stick it in everybody's face and force them in some sense to deal with reality. But that's very difficult. It requires, so we would like somebody to, you know, uh, take our head out of the sand when we stick it in the sand, but when we're very afraid, we really don't want to take the head out of the sand. So there's a commitment problem here. Uh, if there's a, we would like to put in place uh, Cassandras who repeat warning signals, who, uh, you know, alert us to the dangers that we might be inclined to look away from, but when the danger is there and they, and they are pointing our attention to it, we don't want to see it, okay? So <clears throat> that's why it's not so easy to um, limit these type of group things phenomena, group thing phenomena, and that is also a way to understand role of institutions uh, such as in the political area, uh, arena, constitutional guarantees for free speech, free press, more generally institutions that protect or even encourage dissent, including in corporations, devil's advocates, whistleblower protection laws, etc. These are ways of, of committing ourselves to the truth, even though we know that um, when the bad news hit, we won't, not, we won't want to face the truth, but we have to find a way of forcing ourselves to see it. And uh, we, so we have to protect the Katandras, and it may or may not be so easy to do. Let me move on now to uh, market interactions, uh, <clears throat> because that's kind of a current topic. So the story here is going to be the ve very similar, but it's going to be instead of some um, interaction between how people in the company think, how they deal with reality, it's going to be about investors, how they think and how they deal with reality. So again, a few examples of the potential relevance of collective delusions, rationalizations, etc., to what we have uh, seen in the last couple of years. Excessive certainty. It's hard for us, without being flippant, to even see a scenario within any kind of realm of reason that would see us losing one dollar in any of those transactions. That's a strong statement made by the manager of AIG's financial London unit, which uh, blew up the company by taking bets on uh, hundreds of billions of credit default swaps. Let's look at Lehman. An investor asked, so this was kind of already way into the crisis, an investor asked the chief financial officer why they were not raising capital like Citigroup and Merrill. This was a really bad question to ask. The CEO uh, glared at the questioner and said they didn't need more money after all. And the proof was they still had to post a loss. So, you know, we get into this idea that if I don't want to recognize a loss, then there is no loss. The company had industry veterans in the executive suite who had perfected the science of risk management, she said. 
Um, we know when we need to be worried and when we don't. Uh, Alan Greenspan was asked in congressional testimony whether he was at all concerned that if one of these huge institutions that I just mentioned fail, it will have a horrendous impact on the national and global economy. No, I'm not. I believe that the general growth in large institutions have occurred in the context of an underlying structure of markets which makes many of the, in which many of the larger risks are dramatically, dramatically was not strong enough, I should say fully hedged, fully insured. Okay? So again, it's a sure thing, there's no risk. Another rationale that I mentioned before is this time is different. Okay? We're circumstances, uh, previous circumstances are not, do not apply. We have a wealth of information we didn't have before. We understand the data and can price that risk. This was countrywide. I don't think it's a bubble, said uh, the chief of the Carlyle Group. So if it's not a bubble, what is it? What's happening now is that people are beginning to use a different investment technique called private equity, which adds real value. So as usual, you know, there is some truth to, a potential truth to these statements, but there's also, uh, a, a, I, at least I feel, a degree of delusion, especially since these are the arguments you hear every time there's a bubble, every time there is a kind of investment frenzy. Let's talk about uh, housing uh, um, and uh, subprime mortgages. So United Capital Asset Management, which no longer exists, uh, was um, you know, putting out a lot of them, and the chief executive thought that the consumer has to be an idiot to take on those loans because they'll never be able to repay. Nonetheless, he was uh, selling a lot of them, of these mortgage-backed securities, and they were one, one of his best performing investments until, of course, uh, things went south and the, the fund first lost a lot of money and then closed, um, it was bankrupt. So now let me try to think, to do the same kind of little um, semi-formal exercise of thinking about how individual investor psychology will interact with economic forces, in this case an asset market, like the housing market or the market for housing, for mortgage-backed securities, internet startups, uh, etc., to generate a potential a wave of uh, irrational exuberance that will lead to overinvestment and then a crash. Um, so let's think of a market that operates in the, f in the form f following way. There's a first round of investment when uh, a new technology or a new financial instrument appears and you can, individual investors can get in, start investing if they want. Okay? And in general, you know, this is at, in, at least initially this promising so people get in. Then we get some news about f market prospects, future demand, et cetera, or whether people c will be able or not able to repay their mortgages. So again, we get a red flag or a green flag, and red flag might be more and more people talking about the presence of a bubble in the housing market or the fact that consumers have taken on unsustainable levels of debt, et cetera, et cetera. Investors, both individual investors and institutional investors, now have to deal with these news, with these kind of scary news. They're scary because you already have some of these things in your portfolio uh, based on the fact that initially it looked good. And so you can be realistic, in which case you become a bear, or you remain bullish, you dismiss the bad news, you dismiss the Cassandras, and you engage in some degree of denial. I'm excessively simplifying here, of course, it's never completely black and white. Then after that, once you've processed the news, we can either keep investing by, you know, if you're somebody who's buying houses and trying to flip condos, you can buy more of those and borrow more. If you're somebody who is buying mortgage or uh, a bank that's putting mortgage-backed securities on this balance sheet, you can buy more of them, et cetera, et cetera. You can escalate or stop. And if you have remained bullish in spite of red flags, you'll escalate if you've uh, chosen realism, you're less likely to escalate and you will stop. And then finally, the market delivers its verdict. Demand is confronted with supply. People either can pay or cannot pay their mortgages um, and so on. Um, and the price ends up being high or low and that generates gains or losses depending on the positions that people had. Okay? And the price will be high or low depending on two things. First of all, how much people have invested. The more supply, the more houses have, the more houses have been um, built, the lower will the price of housing be. Uh, the more of these more 
of these uh, securities have been issued, the lower their price will be, et cetera. Uh, so the total supply, if you want, in both rounds of investment will depress the price. And on the other hand, you know, there is demand, which could be high or low, or some other state of uncertainty, which is what we're learning about with these red or green flags. Um, just to make the point that, um, so in the meantime, okay, just as before, uh, until the market delivers its ultimate verdict, we live with fear or hope of, you know, rags and riches and so on. And so we might have a, um, an incentive to engage in motivated thinking of the kind that I've described. In particular, that's true if the assets and questions are not very liquid, don't have a market in which there is an objective price from the, from the first day. Okay? And what I want to show here is that this was indeed the case for these mortgage-backed securities. So these are the balance sheet of Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, I think around 2006 or 2007 in billions. And assets are, dis are divided in three levels. Level one are assets that trade in active markets with readily available prices. So it's hard to deceive either others or yourself about a level one asset because the price is, in, is printed in the paper you know, every day or even um, more often than that. But for these two, these were only between 35% and 17% of their assets. Much more was invested in level two assets which are called mark to model. So there is not a liquid market for these assets. You have to um, you know, run a statistical model and make some assumptions about what they're worth. So there's more degree of freedom to get in or to believe what you want to believe. And those were 56% at Lehman and 74% at Bear Stearns. Level three assets, there's not even a model that you could use to figure out what the price is. Instead, the price that is used, quote, reflects management's best estimate of what market participants would use in pricing the asset. So it's basically management's best guess. 8% at Lehman. 18%, sorry, 8% um, also at Bear Stearns. And my point is, you know, with these assets, again, you can put a price that will, you know, deceive your investors, but that's dangerous. You could go, you know, you could be prosecuted for that. But it's also very easy to deceive yourself that these things are worth more than they actually are. Similarly, credit default swaps. Worldwide, the market was about 50 trillion. Yep, very good. It's about 50 trillion, but there is no single um, well-operating market where you can go and sell your credit default swap and immediately find uh, a buyer and there's an objective price. It's all um, bilateral transactions. It's so these assets, CDSs, as well as the other things that these banks had on their balance sheets, corresponded to wh what I was kind of uh, representing here in a stylized way. It's some investment that you make and you won't know what the price will, the objective price will be for a while. In the meantime, you have to live with the uncertainty and you have some degree of flexibility or ambiguity in what you should expect about the price, um, the final price, whether it's going to be high or low. So now again, the question is exuberance, by which I mean people do not pay attention to red flags and just assume that the price of housing keep rising or that uh, you know certain securities will uh, always uh, keep paying off. Does the fact that other people are exuberant, does that become contagious? Does that make me, the individual investor or the individual bank, less or more likely to become also exuberant and to just forge ahead with more of, of, of these assets? So there are two effects here. Uh, of the blindness of other investors to, let's say, warning signals of, an, of, uh, <coughs> of trouble ahead. The first, w so if other people, other investors are irrationally exuberant, let's use that phrase, they will keep investing by building more houses, uh, putting more of these uh, securities on their balance sheet, and, the l and then in the end, there's going to be a glut on the market, and the price will be not just low, but very, very low. We're again in this situation where the blindness of others hurts everybody because it's going to further depress the price that uh, these assets are worth. Now, if I have seen a red flag and if I have some feeling that other people are not paying attention, I should expect that there's going to be a lot of overinvestment and that the final price will be very low. 
on one hand, this should make me be cautious, say, well, if I don't pay attention, again, this is not necessarily um, all conscious, but if I, don't if I don't pay attention to the red flag, if I dismiss it, if I remain bullish, I'm going to buy more of these assets or build more of, this, uh, of, of these houses, and I'm going to make losses on that, uh, on those extra investments, and those losses will be even larger due to the fact that other people are over-investing and the market is going to collapse. So this uh, argues for caution. On the other hand, even if I don't invest more, I've already invested. I'm already in this market. I already have some of these securities on my balance sheets, hundreds of billions of them, or I already own houses uh, or condos, and these are not so liquid. I can't get rid of them very easily for the reasons that we've seen or, or to the extent that we've seen. Therefore, I'm going to make, if we are indeed in the red flag um, situation, I'm going to make losses on the investments I've already made. And it may be hard to recognize or to, to others, to my, let's say, shareholders, but also to myself or to my wife, that uh, I'm going to make those losses. And those losses are made larger by the fact that everybody has invested too much and that the market is going to collapse. So if this uh, reality worsening effect, which is you know, related to the mutually assured destruct, um, delusion idea, dominates, then the more people overinvest out of irrational exuberance, the greater will be my incentive to overinvest out of irrational exuberance. And this will become contagious, and we will have a market mania. So you need two things. You need that we enter the situation in which bad news arrive with market positions that are large enough. We've built up sufficient inventory because things initially looked good. And that these assets be relatively illiquid. Under those two conditions, um, if things work out fine, the market will be realistic and stop when it sees a red flag. But it's equally likely that it will ignore a, a, the red flag and that we'll be caught in this wave of uh, over optimism and excessive investment. So the market mania will be contagious, we'll have over investment and an eventual crash. Let me uh, skip what I was going to talk about ideology uh, in the interest of time because of, um, <coughs> unless there are some questions on this, I want us to end with five main kind of results. Uh, this general idea that denial is like a disease, it's contagious when it hurts. And when you don't want it to spread is when it spreads. And when it's good, then when we call it morale, is when it precisely when it doesn't spread enough. That collective realism and collective wishful thinking can take hold and persist in firms, organizations, governments, etc. Especially if they start at the top, they will trickle down. That in order to counter that, we need some constitutional protection for dis or even encouragements of dissent, whether in the political area arena or in the corporate or organizational arena. Uh, market manias and crashes work very much in the same way. So again, we need some things that will force us to, um, to look at unpleasant evidence. And then, uh, this is what I will not talk about, the same thing applies for beliefs about you know, whether markets are good or governments are good, the kind of things I showed you at the beginning. And you can have, again, the same types of collective delusions with some countries believing excessively in the virtues of the market and uh, lack of regulation, and other countries believing excessively in all the good things that the state can do and that uh, public intervention can do. And again, uh, we, have to be, uh, we have to recognize the fact that these collective delusions arise from individual psychological traits that are basically um, innate or very hard to change, and what we need are some institutions, particularly having to do with you know, forcing us to look at the truth in order to prevent uh, these cases of collective blindness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, much Roland. Um, are there people with microphones? Uh, has someone got microphones to pass around? <laughs> Ivana. Um, I enjoyed that very much. I'd just like to ask Roland, if you'd be happy that we forward the whole of his presentation up on our website so that, uh, because uh, I cut you short, and um, I think people would like to see the uh, ideology uh, aspect of that. Um, I, um, 
first question is over here. Thank you for, uh, name is Louis, Mr. Wait, uh, thank you for your talk. May I ask you where you would you locate in your model or scheme, uh, Mr. Chuck Prince, former CEO of City, who famously declared in July or August uh, 2007, uh, he said, as long as the music goes on, uh, one has to step up and dance. I don't know what's going to happen when the music stops. A uh, month later, he was thrown out of city uh, because of the losses. So he was clearly referring, uh, you know, I quoted uh, Chuck Prince, I may quote Jérôme Carbiel or whoever you like, uh, people who go on playing, though they are aware that something is not uh, right, simply because the others are still dancing. Right, so I think if I understand your question correctly, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a combination of, of let's say, cynicism that reflects just the incentives that, that, that they face, uh, the pressure to generate high returns because everybody is currently generating high returns, together with some um, excessive optimism, I think, that you're, you'll be the one who can, um, you know, stop and get the chair before the others, that you won't be the one left holding the hot potato. And um, Citigroup was um, not, you know, not as badly hurt as the others like Lehman and Bear Stearns, but in the end they got hurt a lot, in particular due to second round of investments that they did later on. They bought some of these trouble companies and then they inherited those troubles and he paid down the line the price of his um, excessive optimism. So I think, you know, it, fit, it seems to fit reasonably well the story that I was trying to tell. Other questions? I wonder, Roland, do you know the paper, the working papers by Phillips Wu and you and Phillips and you on rolling bubbles? And how do they relate to what you, Phillips and you have argued that what we've seen is a sequence of bubbles which have rolled through the economy, starting with NASDAQ uh, and rolling through subprime, um, oil, etc. So one bubble follows another as investors, when they get out of one, fall for the next illusion. Right. No, I, I don't know that paper, but, but um, I think, um, you know, the idea sounds right. And, and both, uh, for example, Bob Schiller in his book on irrational exuberance and Schiller and George Akerlof in their book on animal spirits, you know, talk about how there are these, you know, throughout history, and there are now many books on this uh, particular aspect, you know, these cycles of excessive hope and then despair repeat themselves because the human psychology is unchanged and the instruments that we have at our disposal to give it, to leverage it in some sense and, and have it uh, have larger and larger consequences keep getting more and more sophisticated. A question immediately behind. These were Yale working papers incidentally of a uh, couple of months ago. Uh, Professor Gilbert was saying uh, we've, be, we've been uh, experiencing a lot of bubbles, so in the end, uh, someone should learn about it, and uh, is there a scope for learning in your model? Or uh, you mean that uh, humans are able to uh, decide not to learn after they... Um, so, I mean, the real question is whether the scope for, wor for learning in the real world um, and uh, I think there's a, there's a limited scope for learning. Um, I don't have it here, but actually there's a, there's a nice quote from Alan Greenspan again uh, after the, um, I think it was after the internet bubble where he said explicitly that uh, there had been a, a surprising extent, oh no, actually it was actually the wave of corporate scandals um, earlier than that. There had been uh, you know, a lot of malfeasance that we needed to put in and that uh, we knew it now, but uh, um, we, people have a tendency to forget and that we needed to put in place regulations uh, so that it wouldn't um, happen again. And then, you know, the next bubble came and he actually argued against regulation. And so he himself, in some sense, forgot the lessons of history, I think. So I think uh, we can't rely on individual psychology uh, or or. or on our limited cognitive abilities to, to, to remember always the lessons of history. Um, we're fallible, plus it will be a new generation next time, etc. So what we need are kind of institutions with long memories 
uh, both uh, in terms of you know how we structure um, financial markets or other you know uh, corporate law, etc., and also I think um, you know things like the the press and and the media. They don't always have long memories, but at least you know they they can keep a record of what's happened, and that can help us uh, collectively not forget. Now we have two questions here: one and then one a little bit further forward. Farò in italiano la domanda, è possibile? Sì, certo. Ultimamente su. La traduzione verso l'inglese dovrebbe essere sul canale 2. La sente adesso? Ok, grazie. Ok, it seems technicalities have been settled. Ok. Good morning, my name is uh, Garbari. I recently read an Callisto Tanzi, By Callisto che Tanzi, è responsabile del crack Parmalat, the for the il Parmalat, quale lamentava uh, di uh, uh, aver sofferto di manie di grandezza, identity crisis of the delusion of grandeur and he said that none of his family had helped him uh, look at things with realism. The, my question is a bit ironical. Uh, can't we run the risk of having these people uh, simply brought to a mental hospital and take up no more responsibility for what they've done? This is a, a statement a statement by Callisto Tanzi. He said, um, I had a delusion of grandeur. I was not aware of what I was doing, and none of my family helped me. I read that a couple of uh, days ago. Don't you think that they, all these people may be acquitted for what they've done simply on the basis of an alleged uh, mental impairment? So I... I quotation, but I'd be interested to, to, to read it and to have it. Uh, I think it's, so I don't know the particular case, I think it's probably understandable that his family didn't help him look at things realistically because to the extent that they themselves had high stakes in things, you know, going well and, 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 and not uh, ending the way they did. So if you're, if you're benefiting from something that is dangerous, that's when you uh, and you will be very hurt if it collapses, that's when you don't want to see the dangers. And I think most likely, you know, his family also had benefits from, from the operation. Uh, in terms of, uh, you mentioned people like him, I think that we have to be careful not to, um, not to, to treat people who are caught up in these collective, by the way, very often uh, waves of overconfidence or, or delusion, as uh, pathological cases. I think we all have these tendencies and um, it's just a matter of the incentives that you face and whether they will lead you or not to, um, to engage in these kinds of delusions. I don't know that, I don't think it should, you know, absolve from uh, legal responsibility, especially if there was, um, um, if there were illegal acts, but I don't think we can, with some exceptions, perhaps, you know, Bernard Madoff is an exception, uh, I think we all have, we, we could all be in that situation, I think, given the right situation and given the right incentives. That's why it's so dangerous. Yeah, I'm sure Parmalat conforms exactly to your story, actually. P Parmalat was financing Parmalat, financed the football club. 
everybody in Palmer knew that there were questions you shouldn't ask about Palmer Latin. Next question. Okay. Uh, well, it's working. Yeah. There you go. Uh, is, there, is there a button? There's a button. So now, now it's working. Um, I'm thinking that uh, compared to other work, um, you know, most, most work on bubbles emphasize um, false beliefs. Um, but your model seems to uh, identify an additional factor having to do with preferences, having to do with people liking to be optimistic. Um, and, these, uh, and liking to be optimistic seems to be good uh, in some cases, it generates, um, you know, um, more effort, uh, and it seems bad uh, in other cases. So, but are you suggesting that maybe uh, we should think very carefully about what per what personality traits we match with what positions uh, in our society? Where should we not have optimists? Right. So let me answer your question in two parts, and the first part is maybe more of a, an economist conversation. I think most models of bubbles and things like that we have do not emphasize false beliefs. If you think of standard rational stochastic bubbles, people are doing exactly the right thing. They know the risk they're taking. They're not under any delusion. Even if you think of what are called um, informational cascades or uh, herding models, people um, are just looking for more information and they, they, they follow the crowd because it's likely that the crowd has more information. If they had a brother-in-law who was a statistician and they asked their brother-in-law, what should I do to have more information given this is the way the market operates, the brother-in-law would agree that they should follow the crowd. So <coughs> these, are, these are not, so on the one hand we have these, um, let's say, historical or, or sociological accounts of bubbles, manias, crises, etc., which are full of stories about uh, people telling themselves that it's, this time is different, we're smarter, uh, I can get out before the others, etc., which are all about delusion. And the economic models that we have so far, they are, they are useful, they capture uh, important aspects, but they don't have these aspects of delusion. And in order to understand why people might engage in biased processing of evidence, you have to understand the psychology, the motivations behind it, the fear, the anxiety, the hope for riches, you could call it greed if you want, but again, this is something we all have, the competitiveness. So that's the first part. Um, I, think, I think these emotional, this interaction between emotional or individual psychology and uh, bubbles, etc., has not been adequately captured before. Secondly, I think matching uh, psychological traits um, to positions, uh, I think, yes, uh, you know, that's hard to, that's, that may be hard to do, but the point is the same traits that might be very good in one organization or at one stage of the organization can become very dangerous. So, for example, People who create a company, entrepreneurs, uh, are very often people who, you know, have no self-doubt, who think that they can, um, they can do whatever, you know, whatever they set their mind to. They, ha they are typically extremely self-confident, and their self-confidence is contagious. And this is a good thing, uh, maybe, to uh, at, at the stage when you need to to motivate your workers to raise capital, etc. But later on, when you're, let's say, running a big company, then you have access to um, financial leverage that your actions start affecting uh, other market participants, this can become very dangerous. So I think, indeed, the traits that um, we all have different um, degrees of, let's say, susceptibility to wishful thinking, to uh, over-optimism, et cetera, and uh, to the extent that it's possible, uh, it would be good if people were matched with either jobs or uh, phases of a company or phases of the organization that in which those traits are, are valuable uh, in terms of morale rather than dangerous in terms of um, contagious um, and detrimental overconfidence. Other questions? I'm impressed by the heterogeneity of investors. Um, and the heterogeneity of different types of investors. I have 
friends who've made quite a lot of money over the last two years. Uh, um, hedge funds have been much maligned, um, but have generally participated, I think, in a positive way over the current crisis, over the recent crisis. And many of them, by short selling into uh, bubbles, and correctly short selling into bubbles, um, they've come in for a lot of stick for that. Um, it seems to me that the good macro hedge funds um, pride themselves on integrity, integrity of judgment, and uh, that has proved valuable. Um, so, in a sense, a, a market response to what you're saying is, well, this just, make, this just gives the stage to the smart guys who can see when things are not fundamentally based and who do, are prepared and have got the pockets to take the, to take the long view. And I'm being deliberately provocative. Yeah, so I think, you know, this is, this is related to what I was saying before. If, if, if there's someone or some organization that actually benefits from other people's excessive optimism, this uh, person or organization will not be uh, induced to join in, but they will behave very cynically. It's when they're kind of prisoner of the other people's uh, excessive optimism that they want to basically uh, join in. Uh, and uh, I think there is a role for short sellers. Uh, you can, th even though you know it might, they might not, not, might not be very popular, but you can think of them as as these Cassandras that, except they're you know they're doing it for the money, but um, um, by their actions, you know they are raising again the red flag in a very visible way that this company, this sector, whatever. Uh, is headed for losses rather than gains. So I think there is, uh, they, there is definitely a role for that. The evidence shows that you know it's not sufficient, um, and in fact, short selling is only a very small fraction of I think something like two percent of, of all to, of all um, because uh, of various reasons. So I don't think we can rely just on that, and certainly we can't rely on the fact that they pride themselves on their integrity because everybody prides themselves on their integrity. Questions or shall we uh, adjourn? George, do you want to say something? Well, I was just, I, I, I didn't, I'll, I'll just add a comment about the short selling. That the short selling may establish a market in which we'll give the price of the, the things are going to look like in the future. So it may, maybe even if you have just a few short sellers, uh, I think that was my, what, what I was looking at when I looked as if I was going to ask a question. I agree. Yes, yeah, yeah. but but again, to have short sellers. I, I, I'm not I'm not advocating advocating the short selling. Right. Is the is the is the I believe your story. Right. Are there any other questions? Uh, are there any other questions before I thank Roland very much? I must say uh, I think this has been a very exciting presentation. I've learned a lot. I, um, I anybody who's worked in financial markets, n nobody who's worked in financial markets believes the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, Otherwise, nobody could make money. Um, and we knew that a long time ago from Grossman and Stiglitz. So uh, we have to believe that behavior and beliefs matter. And uh, some, those of us who lived in New York or, or London have sufficiently many friends who've made lots of money from the failure of efficient markets, from actually being able to outsmart the markets, to know that behavior and, uh, 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 and, uh, and beliefs really do matter. And these stories, which as I said before, were for me stories which my friends would tell over dinner about how people would be believing silly things and so forth. To see a model of this is I I very exciting for me. I, I enjoyed it enormously. Thank you very much, Roland. Thank you.